rejoice. We come to rejoice in the enduring promise of God's faithful word today. Joining in the ancient praise of all of God's people in the words of Psalm 147. Can you join me in reading this aloud? Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is
Each week we set aside time for confession and repentance. As forgetful prodigal children returning to the open arms of our loving, holy, and forgiving God. We join you in reading this corporate prayer and confession as we continue in worship. Father, forgive us.
Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture comes to us from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said this, write this down, for these are the words, uh, these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And to the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is the word of the Lord. My name is Ben Myers. I've been coming to Vintage for about a year now, and I play the Cajon. Are we gonna do the other one or are we just gonna hop in? Just gonna hop in? Yeah. I'm good with it. Let's pray. <laughs> uh, Lord, thanks for your spirit. Thanks for the word that you've given us that is your son Jesus and through your son Jesus. Thank you for the life that we have in him. We pray that you would meet us this morning in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, good morning again. Uh, thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We're so glad you're here. For those of you maybe who are new or unfamiliar, with uh, us or with me, my name is Sean. I'm a pastor here at Vintage Durham, and I'm so glad, I'm so glad that the Lord has brought you here with us this morning. Uh, if you have been running with us uh, for a while, then you know that we've been in Revelation and we are in the penultimate week of this book. We've been jumping around. We've been looking theme by theme, what it means to be the church, what it means to be a worshiping people, what the kingdom of God looks like on earth as it is in heaven. And we're finishing up with that idea, with that theme of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And in this moment, I would normally do sort of a recap so that we could see uh, all the things that God, through Jesus, through John, has told us about his kingdom. Uh, but that's actually going to come in the context of actually reading the passage. Uh, instead, I want to remind us of the circumstances under which God's people first received this word. The church in the moment, was under Roman rule. And Roman rule, this is pre-Constantine, if you want sort of that historical backing, right? It's, it's Domitian or, or uh, Nero, uh, whichever it is, they were experiencing vast persecution. Brothers and sisters, families being torn apart, by the state as they seek to, sought to eliminate sort of this rogue Jewish cult of followers of this 
Nazarene carpenter who they kept saying was Lord. You see, at the day, in the day, at the time, the highest declaration of importance was that Caesar was Lord. You see, Roman occupation, the Roman Empire would gobble up nations and people groups, and, and with those nations and people groups were cultures, and with those cultures were varying religions, and Rome did not typically and would not often tell you you had to abandon your religion or you had to abandon your culture. They, they sort of knew that that was not a good way to maintain a varying group of people who outnumbered you. They did it by the might of their military, yes, but they also said, you keep your gods, you keep your ways, but you also acknowledge that equal to and above that is the reality that Caesar is Lord. And if Caesar is Lord, then the highest and truest reality of how things are and always will be is the empire, the kingdom over which Caesar is Lord, Rome. And for many, for most, this was a deal they could make. Largely because the alternative was really painful and often deadly. This is what the early church experienced. They would not say Caesar is Lord. They would proclaim only that Jesus was Lord. And in doing so, they would not say that Rome is ultimate, but rather only that God's kingdom, the one where Jesus reigns, that's ultimate. And that's what we're looking for. In, in a sense, they, they followed the words of Jesus that we heard when we walked through Matthew. And you remember when they asked Jesus about taxes and if it was lawful to pay taxes or not? And what did Jesus do? He held up a coin and he said, look at whose face is on that coin. Whose image is on that coin? Oh, it's the image of Caesar. All right then. Render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and render unto God what belongs to God. So let's walk that out for a second. The reason the coin belonged to Caesar is Jesus is saying is because it bears his image. So Caesar's entitled to that. But what Caesar is not entitled to is that which bears the image of God. That belongs to God and to God alone. Now what bears the image of God, or rather, who? People. We do. We do. So Jesus says, you bear the image of God. Therefore, your highest belonging, your highest allegiance, your highest praise and worship, your highest trust and resource, your highest belief is in God. And in his kingdom, and in his power, and in his way. Flash, flash, flash forward. Here they are, demonstrating that reality, and it is leading them to suffering, imprisonment, and death. And it is under these circumstances that John has this vision and writes these words to the church. Now, that doesn't even talk about the fact that John himself is not outside of the suffering. Right? John hasn't been sort of working on his theological uh, omnibus and, and he doesn't have like his system at his reformed dogmatics by, by St. John. And he hasn't just been locked up, you know, in, in Jerusalem seminary writing with no real like repercussions of what it means to be a Christian. Right? He isn't putting articles out on his blog. He's living this life, and in living this life publicly, he is experiencing the same persecution that they fear or experience. In fact, as he writes this book, he has been snatched up, imprisoned, removed from his home, friends and family, and exiled on the island of Patmos. And it's from there, John, a prisoner for the gospel, suffering for Jesus, writes to a people who are suffering and imprisoned and martyred for the gospel. 
what do you say to a people who are suffering? How, how do you comfort, and more than that, how do you encourage people to keep on keeping on? In the midst of pain, trial, suffering, and in the face of death. Now for us, these experiences are not the same. Now, while we may be tempted to get the hierarchy of our primacy and our worship out of order, while while we may indeed be tempted to say that this nation or these people or this group is highest and Lord over Jesus, over against that, while that may be the temptation, the fact of the matter is that our proclamation of Jesus as Lord does not come with the threat of prison or martyrdom. Right? We're not watching the doors right now. We're not gathering in houses at night. Oftentimes you'll hear us or people in our community around our country say things like, isn't it a privilege? Isn't it a wonderful blessing and gift of God that we can gather freely? And, and, and it is, and that's, that's good, and that's fine. That's not the, the threat that we face. Nonetheless, we all face suffering. We all face pain. We endure it. And we all are, whether we distract ourselves enough or not, staring into the reality of death. And if we let ourselves be sober-minded enough and feel enough, for some of us, maybe a lot of us, maybe more than you'd know, that can be a paralyzing reality, can't it? You ever have those moments where you wake up and you're like, ah, I can't do it. Maybe you're already awake and you sit down and then there's that rush over you and you're like, you know what would be the best thing right now? The fetal position. Or maybe you're in that stage of life where just as soon as your head pops over the water from the thing that you were just facing, the next thing is already there to hit you and push you back under. Maybe you've been there for a long, long time. Or maybe, maybe, and this one isn't, none of these are hypothetical. I know them to be true for so many of us. But as we said last week, as a church, we're grieving the loss of a dear sister and member of our staff. Maybe you're facing death, grieving death, contemplating your own death. How do we move forward? How do we hope? How does the kingdom of God speak to us in that? Revelation is written to a people for that purpose. If you look to Revelation to figure out the puzzle pieces of how it's going to end, that may be like a fun like experiment. And I'm not even saying that. Maybe, like, maybe you're right. Right? Like maybe we get to the end and <laughs> you're like the 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 Jeremy Barry in, uh, in Good Place. Like, this guy got it right. Like, like, just the one dude who got it right. Maybe that's you. Congratulations. But, like, in the moment, you are missing the richness and the balm of Revelation. We're coming now to the end of this book, and, and as you heard... John says, then I saw in this vision a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned 
for her husband. We're, we're seeing now the fullness of the kingdom of God happening here on earth as it is in heaven. We've been talking about the fact that we live in this place called the already but not yet, where God, Jesus has come and he's established and we see the foretaste, we see glimpses of his kingdom. We even get invited to participate and to practice and to help build God's kingdom here on earth. We get those tastes of it, but we also live in the not yet, where the reality of death and brokenness overwhelms us. Whereas Phil preached a couple weeks ago, the kingdom of Babylon that, that represents the kingdoms of darkness and of men, the powers that are in opposition to God's kingdom, they still have power in a stronghold on this world. And sometimes in our lives, we live in the presence of death and suffering and fear and doubt and the curse. We live in the already, but not yet. We are eagerly awaiting his kingdom. And John, after unpacking what the kingdom of God looks like, it's now this new heaven and this new earth because the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. And listen, this is what John is telling his people. And, and we're, he's going to use two Old Testament allusions to do that. We'll come to that. But this is what John is telling his people. That in the midst of suffering, Pain and death. Our hope is the promise of the kingdom of God. And the promise of the kingdom is the promise of resurrection. The promise of the kingdom is the promise of resurrection. And we're going to see that in two ways, and I want to explain those two ways as, as, before we even jump in. The promise of the kingdom of God is the promise of resurrection, and that's a past tense promise that resurrection gives us. In other words, the promise of resurrection, the fact that resurrection has happened, is promising us the kingdom of God. In fact, we can be assured of the coming kingdom because of resurrection. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Secondly, though, the promise of the kingdom of God is the promise that resurrection will happen again and it will continue to happen and in fact that it is happening all around us John does this by using two Old Testament allusions and so in this little bit of time that we have left with each other we're actually going to like hop out of Revelation we're going to go to Isaiah and we're going to come back to Revelation see how it all fits together we good with that? all right he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I don't have time really to talk about the sea being no more, but that's like an interesting piece, isn't it? Just know that like while going to the ocean for us might be like a vacation, the sea in sort of ancient Near Eastern myth and as well as sort of Jewish uh, historical religious understanding was a place of uncertainty, was a place of uh, the potential for even the coming of uh, violence and unsafety and death. The sea was also the place that stood between God's people in bondage and God's people in the presence of the kingdom, right? So they had to part the sea and pass through it in order to get to the promised land and out of slavery. God parts the waters in order to create dry land, to have a place habitable for his humankind, right? And so the sea being no more is not like, we don't want oceans. The sea being no more is that even the threat of chaos and destruction and decreation is gone, all right? It's brief, but we got to be. All right, so the new heaven and the new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. If you were reading this and you, you had spent your entire life sort of studying Old Testament scripture, your mind may have, probably would have gone to Isaiah. Now, you would have just said the prophet Isaiah, but we have numbered and chaptered. So we would go to Isaiah 65. Right? You would think about this passage and you'd be like, New heaven and new earth, where have I heard that before? Remember, we said Revelation is a lot of cryptic, coded language that its readers were meant to think back to the things it's alluding to and understand what is trying to be said. So you would think back to Isaiah 65, verses 17, probably through 25, and you would, you would think that, you would hear this, for behold, 
I create new heavens and a new earth. This is God talking to the prophet Isaiah. And the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. All right, so the end result of what God is promising to do is to bring a new heavens and a new earth. Here's what's interesting about that. For people in Isaiah's day, as well as for people in John's day, largely religious understanding, scientific understanding of the world was that we lived in a three-tiered universe. There were three levels. The one we live on was the earth. And then below it was Sheol, or Hades, the underworld, the realm of the dead. And above it, above the earth, were the heavens. It's heaven. Right? And so there's this three-tiered reality. And in Isaiah, God is going to make two of those tiers new. This is pretty amazing. Because what he's saying is God's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. But implicit in just the two is the fact that there will no longer be a need for the third. So we're getting our first hint at how the kingdom of God comes about and what the kingdom of God does. New heavens, new earth. And what does it look like? None of the former things, none of the former things that mark this heavens and this earth, the way things are now, will be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. Behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more no more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days. God is speaking to the reality of lives and of pain. No more shall there be Infants who live but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days, for the young man shall die a hundred years old. And the sinner a hundred years old, ESV. It's fine. I don't have time to explain it. Better translation is the one who dies at 100 years old. All right, so we get there. The wages of sin is death. They die, right? But the one who dies at 100 years old shall be called cursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children in calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them before, before, before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hunt or destroy in all my holy mountain. You need to get a picture of what is going on here. We've talked about this before. This is this recap of the kingdom of God. It's where human flourishing happens where there's no exploitation or injustice. You don't work and labor for another who profits off of you. This isn't about not sharing or living life in community. This is about the the end of exploitation and injustice. You don't grow so that another gets fat while you starve. That's the picture. But it's more than that. You live in harmony and you thrive. Life 
Life is the word. Life is the way. There's no tragedy and death. There's not even a place for death. Rather, people enjoying what is theirs, it goes even further. They shall not labor in vain, nor shall, uh, nor bear children for or in calamity, ESV again, for destruction. In other words, bearing children just so the children die. Now, I probably should have led with a a warning there. And if that is an experience that you've had, I'm so sorry. If you've lost a child, lost a child in the early stages of life, or even a miscarriage, like there is a pain there that runs deep. And often the church doesn't think to acknowledge or acknowledge and people don't know how to speak to it or address it. It is the most sacred and personal hurt. And God sees it and speaks to it and addresses it. God sees you and is with you in your pain and in your grief. God promises resurrection and new life even in the midst of that grief. But going back to this, they shall not labor in vain nor bear children doomed, destined just for death. If those two things put together don't sound familiar, and again, Isaiah is apocalyptic literature, so they're supposed to hear the stories of old and figure out what's going on. It should remind you of Genesis 3 and the curse. What's the curse to, the, to Adam? You will labor and work the ground in vain, and it will fight against you. What's the curse to Eve? You will suffer greatly in childbearing. Childbearing in and of itself, even when it's good and everything goes the way it's supposed to be, will be a painful proposition. So what's Isaiah? What's God saying here in Isaiah? The curse, undone. The brokenness of sin, undone. All of this with the new heavens and the new earth. And what's amazing about it is because it tells us something that deep in our hearts we know to be true. We need more than just a political program. We need more than just nonprofits and social activism and awareness. We need more than just rallies and silence the violence and, and our treaties and our mistresses. We need an entire new world and an entire new way of being the world and humans and those who fill it. In the same way that what you don't need is a regimen for behavioral modification, you need new life. The earth needs to be made new, and God says he'll make it new, and, and John in Revelation reminds us of that. The old is passing away, and, and she is no more, and there's a holy city in the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for, adorned for her husband. The, uh, the, the, the reality that Jesus so deeply loves the world cannot be lost on us. Jesus loves you. And Jesus loves this planet that he created and all of the people who inhabit it. Jesus loves deeply so that the only image fitting is a bride adorned for her loving husband, ready to receive her and to dwell with her forever. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with humanity. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Illusion one. And then he says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain nor any more for the former things have passed away. This is what it means that they've passed away. So we looked at Isaiah 65 very quickly. We'll look at Isaiah 25 verses 8, 9, and 10. It says, he will swallow up death forever. 
You know what? I have to go back a little because this is so good. Verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make a make for all peoples, for all peoples, nations, tongues, tribe, what we talked about last week. So even from Isaiah, God had been eyeing everybody. Omnicultural uh, wholeness, right? On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow and of aged wine, well refined, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the peoples, that darkness, that brokenness. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be on that day. Behold, this is our God. Is what will be said on that day. This is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. And Moab will be trampled down as straw is trampled down. On a dung hill. In other words, God is going to remove all threat of lack of flourishing. That sea no more, Moab no more, it's the same image. What's interesting is if all peoples will be included, that includes Moabites who were cursed in in Old Testament uh, narrative and yet still are represented in the very line of Jesus. Right? Anyway, that, that one was for free. So, this mountain that comes down, this new heavens and new earth, here's what we're seeing is that the Isaiah 65 new heavens and new earth that we hope for comes because and as a result of the swallowing up of death. The death of death is the hope of life. In other words, resurrection. Right, so you're following this. Are you following me here with what John is doing? John is saying what we need is a new heavens and a new earth, and it is coming, and all the old things will pass away, and what that looks like is resurrection. So now, all of a sudden, what we see is that a new heaven and a new earth isn't this is getting destroyed and we're getting a new one. It means that this one is being made new, just like you have been made new. Just like if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has died, the new has come. You're not new like these digits, and I've still got, like, my fingers do this from basketball still, and I still have, but nonetheless, I have been made new in Jesus, and so to have you. It's resurrection. Resurrection is the promise of the kingdom of God. Resurrection is the hope for the people of God. And here's what I love about this, is that we saw it in in, in chapter 7. We see it again. God is wiping away tears from their eyes here in the forever, here in heaven, on earth, here in the fullness of the kingdom. What God does is as people come in, he starts wiping tears from their eyes. What this means is that John, or rather Jesus, is not in this moment and remember what we started with how do you move forward in the midst of suffering pain and in the face of death John does not promise reprieve from suffering or escape from death he promises resurrection listen this can be a hard pill to swallow I know, but if you hear it and receive it, it can also be vindicating. It can also be cathartic, just for a second, in addressing suffering and death and pain. John doesn't say, have more faith. John doesn't say, consider what lesson God might be teaching you. John doesn't say, well, maybe if you hadn't been such a knucklehead, you wouldn't be suffering. Your suffering may not, in fact, likely is not a result of faithlessness or bad choices or sin. Like, 
that you've committed or any other product of your making, but rather the reality of living between resurrections, of living between the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of all things. Which means that rather than trying to avoid our suffering, we walk steadfastly in it. John is saying to these folks, continue to suffer. You will. We cannot overthrow Rome. We will not. That's not how we act. Look at what it means to be victorious throughout the rest of this book. It's suffering, and it's giving up your life, and it's living peaceably among all men, even your enemies. We will not overthrow those who cause us to suffer. We cannot defeat them. They are already defeated. Jesus has triumphed. Endure the suffering because death is defeated and Jesus reigns. He has already defeated death and one day he will swallow it up. Resurrection. God wipes away tears from their eyes because they've suffered all the way into his presence. Now, I pray that you will not suffer all the way until the moment that Jesus wipes the tears from your eyes. But I hope, I hope that even if you do, you will do so with resurrection on the horizon. Because it is. Here's how we access it, and this is where we stop. He says, so he goes from these allusions now. It says in verse 5, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Not all new things. I know I've said that before. Remember that. Not all new things. All things new. In other words, resurrection. Write these down. These words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. How do we access this resurrection hope and this resurrection life? It is to come to the one who gives it freely. Jesus faced death and anguish and pain, not just in his life, but of a dear friend, Lazarus. And when he goes to Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, he comforts them, but he says something very specific to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will not die, and though they die, still yet they will live. Jesus, Paul says, is the first fruits of of resurrection. It's why the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 is so crucial and vital to the faith. Why denial of the resurrection is, frankly, to believe a different understanding, a different gospel of the kingdom. Jesus has died and Jesus is raised and his resurrection is the first promise of all the resurrection. Not just for you personally, but for us and for all and for all of creation. Think of it this way, and this is how we'll end. Um, because it's close to lunch and my stomach is starting to rumble. So we'll talk about food. Not really food, popcorn. Right, so... Most people probably microwave popcorn or like buy it, you know, when they got it behind the glass in the movie theater. But if you've ever actually just cooked popcorn, like made it from the seeds in, in the, the um, pot, right? You put the oil down, you heat it up real hot, you put just a few kernels on and you wait, right? And when that first kernel bursts, it's a sign that the pot is now ready and a guarantee that most, right, it's an uh, analogy, so it's always a little, you know, that you're going to get popcorn. 
So you pour the rest in. And that first pop happened already. So you know that, that the environment is right. And then you see burst after burst after burst until eventually the pot is full and overflowing with popcorn. Jesus is that, that his death and resurrection is that first kernel of resurrection in all of creation. And we live in this place where we are in the pot and we see bursts of resurrection. As people see and come to and savor and know Jesus, we see bursts of resurrection as justice and mercy are done. We see bursts of resurrection as multicultural relationships build. We see bursts of resurrection where there's peace and harmony and joy. We see bursts of resurrection where people are healed or when people pass from death into life. We see bursts and, and those bursts are getting more and more visible, and there will come a day when there is nothing in the pot. There is nothing in creation but resurrection. There is no sea. There is no shale. There are no depths. There is life forever. This is in Jesus. This is the promise. This is our hope. Friends, friends, let's rest and endure in the light of the resurrection and the life. Would you pray with me? We need new life, Jesus. <laughs> we want it. We want the new heavens and the new earth now. We want the fullness of your kingdom. But until then, may we endure suffering well. May we love and serve one another, our neighbors, our enemies. May we do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. May we proclaim your coming and live as resurrection people. In Jesus' name, amen. Each week we hear the good news of the gospel and, and we respond to it. We respond to it in generosity. We remember that Christ is given freely. And so we too ought to give freely of what God has given us. If you'd like to do that, there's, there's a, a, a bowl in the back you can give online. Um, we'd invite you to do that. But we also respond by coming to God's table, which we'll do in a moment, and, and remembering the death and the resurrection of Jesus, what it is that purchased our resurrection. And then when we see the fullness of what God has done for us, free of charge, our hearts are awakened and stirred to worship. So I invite you now to, to stand with us as we continue to worship Jesus.
church, each week we respond to the gospel in a couple of ways. One of the ways we do that is song. Another way we do that is by coming to the table. And each week we come to the table and we remember that Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and he gave it to his disciples. He broke it and he said it would be his body that was broken for them. After that, he would take the cup and he would say it was the cup of his blood. It was the cup of a new and an everlasting covenant that would be poured out for the remissions of sins of, of his people. And, and we do this each week and we remember that, that, that the Son of God would take on flesh and he would live a sinless life and he would hang on a cross to accomplish salvation for his people, yes. And also this morning, I want us to remember that that new heavens and that new earth are promised to his people. And so while there's a present reality of forgiveness and, and, and of our sins for the church in the here and the now, that new heavens and that new earth, that future feast is our future as the church. And so as we take this morning, I just want us to remember that and reflect on that. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll come up, we'll take the bread, which represents his body, and we'll dunk it in the juice, which represents his blood. If you happen to be gluten-free, uh, there's gluten-free options to my right uh, option. There's not two. All right, we're not that extra. Um, to my right, your left. Please use the hand sanitizer before you dunk it in. And if, if you're not comfortable with this, we have the individual serving cups in the back as well. All right. So church, take and eat and be grateful. Drink and be thankful. And remember that we are the blood-bought resurrection people of Christ in the here and the now and that the new heavens and the new earth are our future. Let's worship church.
Jesus Christ. 